Please, uh, welcome. Welcome to the September session of the Mycotalks. So pretty soon we're going to hear from David Corey from Baylor College of Medicine and from Sue Chan Lee from the University of Texas at San Antonio. But before we do, I just want to remind you a little about uh, how the Mycotalks operates. So the philosophy of the sessions is that there will be two 30-minute uh, talks and um, these will be given by people with diverse career stages from various uh, locations and hopefully equal gender. Um, while you're listening to the talks, you can be preparing your questions. So after we hear from the two speakers, we're going to have 30 minutes of in-depth discussion. And please uh, submit your questions through the Q&A, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Please don't use the chat, use the Q&A, and you can, you can do that at any time. And I also want to remind you that the talks are being recorded and they will be available on the MRC YouTube channel very soon. Um, also remind you that these are a monthly event and that you must register for each session. So coming up in October, we will hear from Partha Biswas and Mari Shinohara, and then November from David Andes and Carol Kumamoto. So please remember to register in advance for each session. And then finally, to uh, the trainees in the audience, um, so I want to remind you that there is a separate session for trainees. So this can be anything from PhD students to new faculty, you'll have an opportunity to present your work. And this takes place on the second Thursday of the month, but the timing can also be varied. So if you're interested in joining this, you see the web address there. So I want to introduce now my co-chair, Neil Gao, is going to introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much, Geraldine, and thank you to everybody and a very warm welcome to David Corey, uh, who's going to be the first of the two speakers today, as you've heard. David, uh, officially titled Professor of Pathology and Immunology and Medicine, and Vice Chair for Immunology and at the Department of Pathology and Immunology at Baylor College of Medicine, which is in Houston in Texas. And uh, you will most of you will know about David's research, but he is primarily focused on the discovery of fundamental immune and environmental causes of chronic human inflammatory diseases. And he's doing this to improve, obviously, the diagnosis, prognosis, and therapy of often which are very profoundly disabling conditions. And he's also been a great pioneer in the study of microRNAs in pulmonary disease. And recently, he's uh, discovered that low-grade fungal sepsis due to candida can produce durable brain infections with features which resemble Alzheimer's, which is extremely intriguing to us, of course. So we are very, very happy to welcome you to the series, David, and we really look forward to your talk. And I'll now hand over to you. Super, thank you very much, uh, Neil. Very, very kind introduction. Uh, let me go ahead and, uh, and screen share, and we can uh, get going here. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. Uh, Neil, thank you very much again for the invitation. Um, so, you know, um, here at Baylor, you know, when not a whole lot of people work on fungi, when people need a mycologist, they tend to call me, only to be very disappointed when I tell them I'm not actually a mycologist. I refer them to the real mycologist that I'm very fortunate to work with collaboratively, people local like Michael Lorenz and uh, in Europe, uh, so particularly Julian Neglick and Bernie Huba. Um, and, and so, but we work together uh, and we, 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 to focus on this, this issue of um, what are uh, the fundamental causes of these, uh, these very common chronic inflammatory disorders, as you mentioned. Uh, it, we've started out looking at asthma, science, science. We've moved on to some other things, as you just mentioned. We'll get into a little bit of all of that today. And, but really the, the extraordinary uh, finding, I think, from our laboratory is just how important fungi are to these disorders. And so we use them uh, in our translational work uh, as biological probes to really understand how that immune response uh, develops. Uh, and and it, it is ultimately, it's the inflammation that really leads to the expression of these disorders. So let me develop this concept more with you. Let's begin by considering worldwide uh, what's in the prevalence of some key uh, fungal related disorders. 
which you may not consider to be fungal related, but we'll, again, we'll get into some of that. So severe asthma. So this is the one to 5% of all asthma that, you know, that consumes most of, of the of, uh, medical resources where almost all the mortality is, et cetera. So about 10.4 million worldwide as of 2003. Allergic bronchopulmonary mycosis, a really particularly very severe form of asthma, much, much less, but still very significant, 4.8 million. Chronic pulmonary aspergillosis, uh, you know, uh, the key disorder uh, described and really studied well by David Denning, uh, around 3 million. Chronic rhinositis with nasal polyps. So this is all comers. This is what we just we have uh, uh, studied in some detail. I'll be showing you some of that data. Much higher, about 120 million. Pretty impressive numbers, but that all these numbers compared to any Canada-related disease, which is basically the world's population about 8 billion. So, you know, almost all of us are going to experience a little bit of atopic dermatitis or eczema, thrush, or any number of other disorders that can be directly related uh, to a Canada. Uh, a, a particularly uh, unique fungus that has apparently infected the entire species. We'll talk much more about this a bit later. But, you know, when you ask the average clinician uh, what is, what's the main fungal disease they think about, They'll often tell you invasive aspergillosis. So clearly, this is a very devastating disorder, very high mortality, at least 50 to 60% with the best of medical care, but it's also extraordinarily rare compared to these other disorders. Uh, but yeah, this is the first thing that people tend to think about when they think of fungal disease. And just to illustrate the, 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 the really terrible skewing in the people's, in people's minds on both the research really and the clinical fronts uh, with, with people seeing a, a bit of the tree here with invasive, but really missing the forest of the, uh, the huge number of patients suffering from, from these very, very other common uh, disorders where they're also uh, equally um, fungal uh, related. So again, we study asthma and, uh, and and sinusitis in particular, and we have clearly linked these to fungi. But you know, but how? But what what's really the data? Let me walk you through some of this. Going back about it, as you can see, some of the dates on here. We're going back more than a decade. So we had uh, we we've, we've been seeing fungal elements in sputum of patients that have asthma. Uh, for years, but we but we could never grow it out, uh, and so we just decided we just change how we culture, and we did some very simple changes. And sure enough, if we make these changes now, here are two asthmatic patients here at Ben Top General Hospital here in Houston, stuck on mechanical ventilators, and this is their tracheal aspirates just pouring out fungus, as you can see. The white creamy stuff here is definitely um, Canada, and the gray one here is Alternaria. There's a mixture here in this other patient. This is a a, an administrator in the Department of Medicine heard about our findings, and she had had lifelong asthma, produced sputum and phlegm, you know, every day. We cultured some of her. It came out to be alternaria again. Here's her sputum under the microscope, you know, and just, you know, classic uh, evidence of asthma in the form of charcoal-laden crystals, as you can see here. But if you look a little bit closer, you have to focus up and down to be exactly clear what this is, but this is a fungal mat, right? It's a bunch of hyphae woven together. Uh, it's way too big to have been inhaled. It clearly was growing in her airway. Uh, and it's also shedding, of course, these spores, so it's actively reproducing. Uh, you know, this is all anecdotal, but, uh, you know, very interesting, you know, uh, preliminary data ev uh, evidence, anyway, that fungus is related to the disease here, which is asthma. In more rigorous form, here are some data from some previous work of ours, working with the Ear, Nose, and Throat Surgical Group at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center, right across the street from us here at Baylor. So the surgeons are punching in surgically into the maxillary sinus on the operating table in folks that have uh, chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps with or without asthma. That's here in black. Uh, and, uh, and then on the left, this is these are other patients that have non-allergic forms of sinus disease like chronic rhinosinusitis without nasal polyps, or they have no disease whatsoever of the sinus. They're just going through the sinus to get to a brain tumor or something like that. And looking at now the, the sinus lavage and, and the yield of fungus from that using our improved culture method, we see a huge difference here, 75% versus about 18%. Looking at our sputum samples, I showed you our first our samples, uh, uh, 9, 10, and 11 uh, previously, but we're up to uh, almost 1,000. We're at, almost, we're at right at 997 samples. We now do this as a clinical service for the VA hospital where I work uh, because the microbiology lab does such a lousy job at culturing sputum as all microbiology labs do. Uh, but our yield with the improved method overall 
uh, is around almost 90% of fungus uh, from our asthma patients. Again, that standard culture yield from the standard microbiology laboratory, usually going to be zero. If you get anything, I mean, you might have a 10% yield. But most of that yield is going to be Canada, which grows a little bit better than these molds do using standard techniques. So that's been a huge problem. Uh, but OK, so we have an improved culture method. We find a huge relationship in terms of culture yield and disease. But really, uh, that's just correlative. Is our, what's, what's really the functional data indicating that, that these fungi are actually causing that disease? Well, one thing you can do is, is work through Cox postulates. I won't bore you with uh, the whole thing, but we have done that. I'll show you some snippets of data here. One thing you can do is take the fungi that you isolate from the human airway, and I'm showing you 13 different fungal species, and you can give these to mice uh, intranasally. Our standard protocol, 400,000 spores intranasally every other day for about two weeks, and then we measure uh, indices of asthma. So here, we're looking at airway hyperreactivity. This is the sine qua non uh, physiological change linked to asthma. This is based on the diagnostic tests, in fact, for asthma. We're looking at increases in airway resistance or uh, technically respiratory system resistance plotted ag against increasing amounts of acetylcholine injected intravenously after challenging uh, mice in comparison to the negative control mice, which are here at the bottom. As you can see, the, in the increases, significant increases here above, um, above vehicle control indicate airway hyperactivity. They can all do it. Uh, let's leave off um, uh, curvularia, which is a very different kind of fungus induces, induces an invasive uh, pulmonary disease phenotype, which is not exactly asthma. Of course, uh, the rest of these are non-invasive. They just grow along the airway, hence the, our term airway mycosis. They can all do it, although some are a little bit better at this than others. So things like, for example, Aspergillus flavus, penicillium, et cetera, you know, these are more potent, if you will, things like Pseudomyces variadii, not as potent, but again, they can all do it. And we've gone way beyond this. We're at least at 20 different species, including Canada albicans. They can all induce asthma-like disease. But then you can take, you know, the virulence factors that come from these organisms, and we focused on proteases. So here is the secreted um, uh, aspergillus pepsin one that comes out of Aspergillus oryzae. We call this PAO for short. So we're giving just a single molecule, seven micrograms every other day intranasally to mice for about two weeks. Again, looking at that respiratory system resistance, very strong increases in airway hyperactivity with just a single molecule. Eosinophils in the airway of these mice go from uh, nothing to several million. IL-4 secreting cells go from nothing again to several uh, tens of thousands. And MUC5AC, one of the main uh, mucin-related genes linked to human and mouse asthma, can go up to 60-fold. Um, for example, so you can give the whole organism, you can give a single molecule derived from these organisms, and you get pretty much the same kind of disease. So how, but our question is, and what we've been trying to track down, well, but how does this mechanistically, how does this work from an immunological perspective? So, so in the interest of time, I'm going to just summarize through this kind of schematic. Here's what we've discovered. So the proteinases begin secreted uh, early on after the uh, you inhale these spores um, uh, and along going along the epithelial surface, those proteases are begin to be made. They drive a program uh, which has remained very mysterious up until just very recently, um, driving the adaptive immune programs of T, T helper type 2 or TH2 and TH17 cell induction. Uh, the protease also drives uh, chemokine programs from epithelial cells that recruit TH2 and TH17 cells to a, to a, back to a very tight peribronchovascular location. And those TH2 cells will secrete their canonical cytokines, things like IL-4 that drives IgE, of course, but also alternatively activated macrophage programs. IL-5 drives that eosinophilia, but really the airway hyperactivity, the physiological changes are are really driven by that IL-13, uh, which acts on airway epithelium and smooth muscle to drive, again, the excessive contractility, but also goblet cell metaplasia, mucus hypersecretion, and other features of asthma. Looks like a pretty good model to me, but not a whole lot else to fill in, except figuring out how you get those Ts2 and Ts17 cells. But in fact, we stumbled into a whole nother innate immune story, uh, which we published some years ago now, but I'll just quickly review here. Uh, that involves clotting factors. So fibrinogen, our main clotting factor, uh, which is produced, in fact, by airway epithelial cells and is always present in the airway lumen of mice and humans, is a target for these fungal proteases. So cleavage by fungal proteases leads to the what we brilliantly have named fungal fibrinogen cleavage products 
These things are immunologically active. They bind to toll-like receptor 4 that is expressed on airway epithelium and macrophages. The effect of such binding uh, is to make these um, uh, airway epithelial cells and macrophages highly effective uh, antifungal effectors, secreting antimicrobial peptides. Mac macrophages are also become more phagocytic and take up spores and destroy them that way. Another thing that happens by binding fibrins and cleavage products to epithelial um, uh, uh, toll like receptor 4 is to promote the induction of cytokine receptors, for example, IL-13 receptor alpha-1, um, that is then in turn um, uh, uh, then required for, of course, uh, IL-13 secreted by these T2 cells to promote uh, their dirty deeds, including induction of that airway hyperactivity, mucus, et cetera. So we have the innate immune side synergistically acting with the adaptive immune side to produce the complete phenotype. And so if you don't have, for example, to like receptor 4 in the airway, you can't get IL-13 to be active to induce that airway hyperactivity, um, et cetera. But again, our central question is that we've been working on for more than you know a half a quarter century or so. Where do those T S two and T seventeen cells come from? So we took a break now, uh, from from mold because I ran into Julian Neglick at a meeting in twenty seventeen to introduce me to the wonderful world of Canada and Canada license, of course. Uh, but uh, but also uh, I got to know Bernie and uh, we we started talking about their the, the proteases, of course, that are mediate, mediated by um, by um, Canada albicans. Just showing you the ten different secreted aspartic proteinases or SAPs that you're probably familiar with. We know a lot about SAPs one, two, and three. We know that four, five, and six are expressed on hyphae, and let's face it, we don't know a whole lot about seven, eight, nine, and ten, but but we know that they exist. All right, so we wanted to switch to Canada, and we wanted to focus on those SAPs to see how important they were uh, in our model. But first, we did this simple uh, Western blot. Here, we're just taking um, fibrinogen um, from, uh, uh, this, is, this is human fibrinogen, and here we're adding uh, either this, uh, a mixture of secreted aspartic proteinases from Canada or the proteinase from Aspergillus mellius. This is a closely related protease very, very, very similar to, to PAO I showed you earlier, the proteins of Aspergillus oryzae. And again, with a couple of hours of digestion, <coughs> excuse me, of fibrinogen with PAM, again, we see the appearance now from the parent uh, fibrinogen shown here of these um, fibrinogen cleavage products. Again, these are the immunologically active moieties that bind to TOL4. But if you cleave uh, fibrinogen, uh, it readily cleaves fibrinogen for sure, but you don't get these these um, these um, fibrinogen cleavage products. And we, we're starting to think, well, maybe we're getting into trouble here. Maybe there might be something fundamentally different uh, going on. Uh, and in fact, um, it, there is something quite extraordinary happening with Canada that's very different from the molds. Again, in the interest of time, I'll just quickly summarize uh, that Canada uh, secretes, of course, Canada lysin, this lytic peptide toxin uh, discovered by Julian. But we discovered, uh, working with Julian, that um, Canada lysin binds to GP1B alpha, the von Willebrand factor receptor on platelets, uh, once it's in the airway. And in, in the effect of binding to GP1B alpha leads to release of this went pathway antagonist protein DICOPF1 or DKK1. And this is the secret sauce that, that feeds back onto developing T cells and secondary lymphoid organs and strongly biases them into the TH2 and the TH17 pathway. That's how you get this very strong adaptive immune response that really determines the overall character and severity uh, of the resulting disease, in this case, um, asthma. Uh, without showing you that data, though, in the interest of time, I'm about, about to just tell you, we've more recently gone back to look at those molds and their proteases that are so otherwise so important. And sure enough, it, it, the mold proteinases like PAM and PAO um, both activate platelets uh, to, to promote release of DKK1. And it turns out in order to get T2 and T17 responses in the mold context, you also need that DKK1. Uh, we don't quite know how the proteinase activates that that those platelets, uh, but we're, we're hot on the trail on that. And we think we'll know an answer to that in the next few minutes. Let me switch now to a completely different disease and that is Alzheimer's disease. And why on earth would a guy who studies asthma, you know, the whole his whole life, why would we suddenly switch to a, to a brain disease? Well, it was sort of irresistible. Um, so we've known for a long time that asthma is um, acquired both in midlife and late life. 
um, is, is uh, linked to development of dementia, particularly Alzheimer's disease. A couple of different epidemiological studies have demonstrated this. There's a third that has also been, uh, been uh, discovered. So this is not a subtle finding. It's actually a very strong risk factor. And then, you know, the neuropathology group in Madrid, Spain, I don't think they're active anymore, but this includes, for example, PISA and Alonso. Uh, they developed their own in-house monoclonal antibodies, and they started hunting around Alzheimer's brains looking for bugs. And sure enough, they found evidence of a lot of filamentous fungal growth happening, ex uh, not exclusively, but predominantly in Alzheimer's brains compared um, to controls. You see both yeast and hyphal forms enter an extracellularly. Um, and they've also found fungal components in the cerebral spinal fluid and peripheral blood um, of these patients. So that was the straw that kind of broke the camel's back. We'd had a lot of experience working with Canada at this point. So we thought, hey, let's see if we can model some of this in mice. But first I had to figure out what on earth Alzheimer's is all about. Let me just quickly walk you through the, um, uh, the, the central dogma of Alzheimer's disease. It's all based on the central protein, the amyloid precursor protein. It's actually widely expressed in many different uh, immune cells, but in the brain, it's mostly expressed by neurons. And this is a transmembrane protein um, that is cleaved by endogenous secretases, and these are transmembrane proteases, basically, cleaves that amyloid beta uh, portion of APP that includes the transmembrane domain um, into a variety of different what's called A-beta peptides of 40 and 42 amino acids, but there are, can be others of different size. Regardless, these are often hydrophobic um, peptides that uh, are not terribly soluble in aqueous solution. And so they tend to aggregate, forming these plaques, uh, uh, particularly the senile plaque, which is a sine qua non pathological finding of Alzheimer's disease. And these things, these plaques, these aggregates, uh, form a pseudocrystalline structure, and hence the amyloid nature. They are often found in complex with DNA. And this is, it tends to be a particularly toxic a combination of DNA and amyloid fibrils that are lead to uh, calcium influxes and uh, leading to neurotoxicity uh, with attendant axon axonal de degeneration, dendrite loss, loss of synapses, and hence your brain shrinks, you lose memory, uh, and you've got Alzheimer's disease. So that's sort of the central dogma. We wanted to know if we can maybe re reproduce some of this using Canada. So here's our model. It's very simple. We, we just inject a very low grade number, 25,000 intravenously to mice. The mice do not react to this. They don't get sick. There's no evidence of illness. There's no fever. But if you take out their brains, and here's a whole mount, and here we're looking at IBO one positive microglial cells and GFAT positive astrocytes in red. What you see are these spherical kind of uh, areas of gliosis, but really they look like granulomas. And hence we call these um, fungal induced glial granulomas because there's no lymphocytes here, there's no macrophages, but you know, but there are microglia which are very much like macrophages. Um, and here, in a little bit higher power, using some different, the same kind of staining, uh, you can see in the center of these uh, roughly 50 to 100 micron structures, you see a lot of DAPI staining. These are very odd looking nuclei that actually stain with calcifloor white. So this is where the fungus is. So somehow these microglia, they heard the candida that has penetrated the blood-brain barrier and gotten into the brain parenchyma and then surround them with these very, very strongly activated microglial and astrocytes. Um, and just a little bit more standing here. Uh, here's about a quarter section of one of these figs. Um, and, and here we're saying for a beta uh, peptides in red, as you can see, lots of a beta, and it is in the center and it's decorating these fungi. And so this is, by, by, the, way, by the way, this is exactly what the senile plaque of Alzheimer's disease exactly looks like uh, and is, is exactly the same structure. Uh, and then and to summarize this a little bit more in schematic form. So we get these figs after a single injection of low dose Canada um, and um, with A beta in the center and amyloid precursor protein enhanced in the rim of where those fungi are. Um, in, the, in the time that during which this inflammation is going, marked by you know pro, pro inflammatory cytokine release, exactly again, as we see in Alzheimer's uh, type 1 interferons, tumor necrosis factor, IL 6, IL 1 beta. Um, it takes about 10 days, but the fungi are completely resolved. But during that time, they mice will show impaired spatial and working memory, all features of Alzheimer's disease, with the exception that um, it is a short-lived infection. It only lasts 10 days. So, uh, and, and we want to know also, so but, but, but how, is, how are these microglia killing off um, these fungi? 
So let me just, again, in the interest of time, let me just briefly schematically illustrate this. So the, the candida gets into the blood. To get past the blood-brain barrier, again, we require the, those saps. All the saps appear to be important here in breaking that blood-brain barrier, dissolving those tight junction proteins. But SAP2 uh, accounts for about 90% of this um, effort. Um, and once we get those figs uh, forming, a couple of different things are happening that uh, lead to the ultimate destruction of these um, fungi. First of all, these saps again uh, play a role here. They uh, uh, so, in contrast to the being completely independent of endogenous secretases, saps cleave amyloid precursor protein directly into A beta peptides. And then we have shown that they engage toll-like receptor 4 as ligands uh, uh, expressed on microglia uh, and trigger activation of microglia to secrete antimicrobial peptides uh, and become more phagocytic for the yeast form uh, of the organism. But as a more important pathway is, again, uh, involving candida lysin. Here, the ligand is CD11B. GP1B alpha is only expressed on platelets, so on microglia, it turns out that the, the other candida lysin receptor is uh, again, MAC1 or CD11B, and this interaction is much more powerful, very strongly activates these microglia to secrete those antimicrobial peptides, become more phagocytic, and, and to resolve these infections. But again, that's really not Alzheimer's, that's, a, that's a, an acute, short-lived infection. Is there a way to turn this into a chronic model? The answer is yes, and it works like this. So it turns out that Canada colonizes the mouse gut, and it's a permanent infection. As far as we can tell, it's never resolved. We have six month data now, and again, it's it's the, the infection in the gut is raging uh, at six months. What, what happens is Canada picks up bacteria in the gut, metastasizes hematogenously to the brain, uh, and al although it's probably you know individual fungi, if you were able to track them, would probably be resolved within that ten day time frame. The problem is as soon as one focus of infection is resolved, more along, coming from the gut. So it's a continuous cycle of brain assault. And, and just to show you some of these data, so if we take the brains out of mice at various time frames, after we've oral gavage OG challenged them with Canada, here's what you get on a Sabra's auger plate when you smash the brain on. But you know, let's look at the high power here. This does, if you know, this does not really look like Canada, right? So this is very irregular colonies, multicolored. When Canada, pure Canada, is of course a perfectly smooth, round, you know, um, pearly looking deal. Uh, this doesn't look like Canada at all. Let's face it. Uh, but but whatever this is, it persists out to day 15. But actually, if you continue uh, checking brains out to day 60, uh, actually, this is the nadir here, day 15. It keeps increasing beyond here. You're back up to, to several thousand uh, at day 60. And if you take apart these colonies under in a wet prep, here's what you see, yeast-like uh, elements. And then there seems to be a bacterial element kind of seen here. And then and there's a, a sort of an amorphous matrix um, like material going on here. Let me skip ahead. And this is a better image of this same kind of polymicrobial colony. You see these very bizarre uh, filamentous looking things with very bulbous ends, extremely bizarre, like, like fungus from Mars or something. Turns out this is uh, Canada. Uh, we've confirmed that by ITS2, whole genome sequencing, but also um, if, we, if we use fluorescent Canada, these structures are, are fluorescing, uh, proving that in fact, this is actually Canada Alpkins, but in an extremely bizarre form. This granular stuff is this matrix. We don't know who's making it or what the chemical composition is, but it is the matrix in which the fungus is growing along with the bacteria, all these little dots you see here. And in the mouse, this ends up always being Aspergillus, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 Staphylococcus aureus. Um, and, but what about human AD brains? So uh, again, we've cultured several uh, of brains now. The, the main yield that we get is the same, what we call now a lichenoid uh, colony. It's a polymicrobial. It resembles a lichen. That is, it is bacteria and fungus growing together. Again, this is from a human brain. We see, again, these yeast-like structures, but there's also some filaments here by ITS2-based sequencing and whole genome. This is uh, Canada albicans. But the bacterial component here is obviously not a staph. It is a filamentous bacterium. We have identified it. It is a member of the Enterobacteriaceae. Uh, but nonetheless, it is the same thing that we see in mice. It is this lichenoid. So we're now calling this a polymicrobial um, biofilm type infection. And this is the dominant microbial growth that you get out of the human brain. And we have um, uh, cultured uh, now three AD brains uh, compared to three healthy controls. 
there's no quantitative difference here, at least yet. We've got a lot more work to do here. Uh, but the vast majority, here's the total yield, uh, but the vast majority of, the, of these uh, colonies are polymicrobial, that is lichenoid. We do see a very, like around 1%, maybe 1% to 5% are pure yeast. Uh, and these are always Canada. So, so far, our data are indicating. Uh, and we do see some, some isolates that are pure bacterial. But again, the vast majority are these polymicrobial. So let me summarize at this point, we're running out of time here, but uh, Ken Alpican's uh, gut colonization in mice leads to polymicrobial that we're calling lichenoid brain infections. There's a strong bacterial component here. Presumably this is derived from the gut microbiome and human AD brains have up to 2 million of these lichenoid colony forming units uh, uh, extrapolated to the entire brain. Um, our preliminary evidence is that all humans are now carrying this type of infection based on our autopsy series and going into uh, down into children as young as 18 months. The only human brains that don't have this infection are from preterm intrauterine fetal demise cases indicating that this infection is not transmitted in utero. Uh, it is acquired probably immediately after birth, but we pretty much all have it. Uh, and so our hypothesis moving forward is that fungal directed polymicrobial or that is lichenoid uh, infections are a root cause of Alzheimer's disease. So let me just quickly conclude. Fungi mediate many common human diseases, asthma, sinusitis, and there's a whole bunch of emerging disorders with fairly weak evidence at this point, but it's growing eczema, inflammatory bowel disease, coronary artery disease, thyroiditis, et cetera, linked to fungi. Understanding how fungi cause these diseases is a key, really key to understanding the complex immune response is long associated with these disorders and is a key, we think, to developing new therapies. Extremely diverse fungal virulence factors, for example, the proteases versus saps versus candidolysin, require our immune systems to be very much on their game. And that leads to the possibility of, of inborn errors uh, arising that lead to uh, subtle immunodeficiency states that we think really that's the key to understanding genetically why some people get severe asthma uh, others, many, most of us do not, but similar with allergic fungal rhinosinusitis and, and early onset neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease. Understanding what those polymorphisms are, I think, is absolutely key uh, to, uh, for um, further understanding the pathogenesis of these disorders. And I will just close by uh, mentioning that improved means of fungal detection and eradication really should be key medical goals for the 21st century. Let me thank the many people in my lab uh, and, uh, and our additional collaborators, uh, Hui at Baylor, Amber at UT, Annalise at Stanford, and of course, our European collaborators, Julian, Bernie, uh, and Peter. I'll be happy. I'll stop there. And I'll be happy to take um, any questions in due time. David, thanks very much. Uh, as you know, we're going to save the questions and have them Absolutely. at the end. And at the moment, I'm going to thank you for that and pass on to my co-chair, Geraldine Butler, who will introduce our next speaker. Thanks, David. That was fascinating, though somewhat scary. So can I just ask the people when you're submitting your questions at the Q&A to uh, proceed them with the initials of the speaker that you're addressing the question to, so we'll know at the end. Okay, so our, our second speaker today is uh, Sue Chan, who's an assistant professor of molecular microbiology and immunology at the University of Texas at San Antonio. And Sue Chan received his PhD in plant pathology, working on Aspergillus nigillans in Brian Shaw's lab at Texas A&M which he followed by postdoctoral training in Joe Heitman's lab at Duke University. So he moved to medical mycology. And his current research uses UCOR to study drug resistance and host pathogen interactions. And we're delighted to hear from him today. So over to you. All right. Thank you, Jeremy, for the nice introduction. And this is my great pleasure and my honor to give a talk at the mic talk. So let me share my screen. So hopefully you can see my screen. So today I'm going to be talking about the novel, uh, particularly carcinogenic inhibitor resistance pathway, a conservative mucor and pitococcus and. It's a new pathway to build a noble link between calcineurin and amino acid permease and protein kinase A in these two fun fungal systems. So mucomycosis is the fungal infection we are interested in the lab, in the lab. 
So mucuralis, there are several species in this, you know, mucuralis are responsible for uh, causing the mucormycosis. They make a spore, it's called the sporangial spore. They are flying and disseminate, can land on any part of the human body. So it seems like there's no particular, you know, the tropism for uh, disease development. It can cause, you know, sinus infection to renal cerebral infection and also pulmonary infection and GI tract infection, kidney and cutaneous or subcutaneous infections. So in general, infection occurs in immunocompromised you know, patients. And interestingly, about 50% of severe neutropenic patients are likely to develop mycomycosis. So mycomycosis is also you know, associated with the transplant recipient and also blood cancer patient. So mycomycosis causing, it's a large area of necrosis. There's a large chunk of tissue damage. So in many cases, surgical debridement is kind of you know, uh, recommended. Because of that, sometimes, Patients can uh, recover from infection, but they may suffer from the permanent disfiguration for the rest of their life. So actually, this patient underwent the you know, this reconstruction. So he was looking like that before. So now, so mycomycosis was you know the sporadic, but now we see more cases than before. So in the in a field after the natural disaster, like in a tornado hit or volcano or tsunami like that, we leave people with you know, trauma injury for the long, uh, extended time. And also soldiers from the battlefield, so they often develop mycomycosis. Sometimes hospital itself is a niche for uh, developing mycomycosis. So several years back, the University of Pittsburgh uh, hospital had, had to shut down their ICU unit because of the spread of mycomycosis there. Recently, there's a sharp increase of mycomycosis in the patient with COVID or patient over 10 COVID. So you have the black fungus infections, right? The thousands of thousands of cases are reported in India and eventually spread to the worldwide. So now mycomycosis is more common than before. So as I mentioned, there are several species that are really involved in mycomycosis, but my lab is using mycocessionality. I denote muco from now. Because this species is genetically amenable, not as robust as Saccharomyces or Candida or Aspergillus, but we can still do the genetics with this species. That's why we chose this species. So this is how muco grow on plant. It's a mold. So it's Spore settled on this plant, then making a hypey, then at a certain moment, they make aerial hypey. Aerial hypey has decorated the round structure called sporangium. Then this sporangium harbors a lot of sporangia spore spore. They will disseminate. So muco is a dimorphic fungus. So in normal condition, like a normal level of oxygen, so spores settled, start growing isotropically, then they establish polarity, then send out jump tubes to make complex mycelium. This is very typical mold growth. But Louis Pasteur found if you put muco in low oxygen at high CO2 condition, they suddenly grow as yeast form. So this is not conventional yeast form because multiple daughter cells comes out at the same time. But at least this is multi-bodied yeast growth. In this case, environmental cue, especially CO2, controlled the morphogenic transition. We found that this morphogenic transition is orchestrated by the, the serine 3 and phosphatase calcineurin. So to refresh your memory about calcineurin, okay? calcineurin is activated by uh, calcium. So calcium carmazolin activate the calcium complex. There are two subunit. So catalytic subunit and regulatory subunit. Interestingly, calcium catalytic subunit has its own auto-inhibitory domain that blocking the uh, catalytic center, the phosphatase center side. But with the regulatory subunit and carmazolin, the auto-inhibitory domain is removed. Then catalytic center is open to the uh, substrate. 
There are two very well-known drugs are there, cyclosporin A and FK506 or tacronimus binds their own cellular receptor, cyclophilin A or FKPP12 respectively. Those complex blocks, the entry of the substrate. This is the, how they block the calcineurin activity. So we found in the presence of calcineurin inhibitor, muco, four different isolate of muco make very compact column. With the microscope, we found that they are exactly yeast form, multi-body yeast form, even high oxygen condition. So this is exactly the same phenotype when muco grow in anaerobic condition with high CO2. So it seems like calcineurin inhibitor actually enforces muco to grow only yeast form. We proved this genetically. We deleted the calcineurin regulatory subunit. So you now we don't have a calcineurin activity in the cell. Then this mutant only grow as yeast locked form. Let's just look at this in white type. It's mold, but only single gene not got change their life cycle entirely. So invasive hypergrowth is kind of you know land uh, the hallmark for to develop the disease and infect the host cell. But blocking invasive hypergrowth instead giving them as a yeast lock form. It seems like calcineurin is essential in virulence in, in a muco, muco. So indeed, the calcineurin plays essential role in pathogenicity in many pathogenic fungi. So cryptococcus is required for the fungus grow at 37 degree and candida are because it grow, uh, it's required for uh, azole resistance and serum survival. And as pagellus, calcineurin is required for invasive hypergrowth. Even plant pathogen fungus, fungus like Maganaforte, calcineurin play a key role for pathogenicity. That's why calcineurin has been suggested as kind of promising target to develop to the antifungal drug. To, put, to do that, so we need to understand you know, the resistance mechanism, how fungus can become resistant to calcineurin inhibitors. This is over a calcineurin pathway, as you can imagine easily. So a cellular receptor gene or target gene can be modified, can accumulate mutations. That result in, uh, a result in the company of resistance. So we verified that the non-synonymous amino acid changes in regulatory subunit or catalytic subunit result in the resistance like this. They, grow hyperly in the presence of a calcineurin inhibitor, right? But this is easy to assume. There's another you know, interesting pathway. So actually muco is able to silence the direct drug target gene. So this drug has nothing to do with this. There's no path uh, blocking the calcineurin inhibitor. Although this is quite novel, very interesting, we found another resistance pathway that is completely different from what we have known before. So we found spontaneous mutants that do not have any mutation in calcineurin pathway, but still they are resistant. We also found the mutant, they can make an invasive hypergrowth even without functional calcineurin, the first. So cyclosporin A is less potent compared to FK506 because FK506 completely makes muco yeast, but cyclosporin A, it inhibits the growth, but still muco manages to grow like in a stunted high peak. But when you knock out one of the catalytic subunit, then this mutant become completely sensitive. They are locked in yeast form. We incubate this mutant in a prolonged time in the media containing cyclosporin A. As you can see, eventually we start seeing sectors coming out of the yeast column. We recover those sectors and grow them again and test. They are indeed resistant to the cyclosporin A and FK506 compared to the parental strain. So then we, of course, we sequenced the entire calcineurin, known calcineurin components that we didn't find any mutations there and there's no silencing going on there. So next, as I mentioned, calcineurin regulatory sovereignty is allowed 
in yeast form because they don't have active calcium unit. Okay? So we incubate this mutant in a prolonged time. Then also we start seeing sectors are coming out of them. So they're hyphy, okay? We recover them, they make hyphy compared to the parental strain. So it seems like there's a calcium bypassing mechanism, right? So then we 12 isolate, six from cyclosporin A resistant mutant and six from calcium suppressor mutant. Then analyze whole genome. Then amazingly, we found the entire 12 isolate has a, some kind of sequence alteration in a common single locus. Okay. We, we call this locus bypass of calcium DNA or bica. Okay, but mutate, mutant, you know, mutation patterns are different. So long deletion or short deletion and different type of uh, SNPs resulting in the uh, amino acid alterations. We sequence that this target, this locus, uh, for the remaining mutant find, almost all of them have mutation in this locus. There are four isolates, don't have a mutation, there's unknown yet. So, but majority of them have, it's like 95, 9% have the mutation in this single genes. What is that gene? This gene is predicted to be a 10 membrane Pan transmembrane domain amino acid permeates. Okay, we verify this is bona fide amino acid permeates for methionine, threonine, and arginine, and they are localized in the cell membrane. So we recapture light in the lab. We genetically disrupt the bica gene. Then we found that this bica mutant is resistant to FK506 and cyclosporin A compared to the wild type. Okay. So we also generate a double mutant. So make a bica mutant on top of the calcinium regulatory subunit mutant. As you can see, so calcinium mutant is locked in this form, but by having extra mutation in bica gene, so phenotype is brought back to the hypergroup. Okay. This is a classical bypassing mechanism of suppression phenotype. So it's completely says bica and calcium is related, is linked. Question is in what way they are linked. So we found calcium indeed negatively regulates the expression of the bica gene. If you disrupt the calcium function by having mutation or by adding calcium inhibitor, you see elevated expression of the bica gene. It looks like a calcinurin is negative regulator of the bica. If you block the calcinurin function, then bica is elevated, overexpressed. That overexpression of a bica is involved in abolishing the hypergrowth and establishing is the locked form. But if you block, here's the bica gene again, then this form bring, is brought back to the hyperbone again. Okay. This is the kind of mechanism, how suppression occur, how calcineurin is linked to this amino acid permeate. So then the question is this link, link is also conserved in other pathogenic fungus like cryptotoxin format. So calcineurin negatively regulate the amino acid permeates. We know this amino acid permeates is a positive regulate of yeast growth. On the, in other words, it's negative regulate of invasive hypergrowth. Okay? So calcineurin is required for the thermal tolerance at cryptococcus, it's virulence factor. Then it, so if this link is conserved in cryptococcus, we assume amino acid permeates is related to the uh, okay, excuse me, somehow. So it's uh, my PowerPoint abruptly closed.
So we assume, so carcinogen is a negative regulator of the amino acid permeans. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. It hasn't come back on your screen yet. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah, I tried to recover that. So yes, everyone, if you could please continue to set, submit your questions via the Q&A rather than via the chat. And if you could preface your questions with the initials. So. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Yes, we can. Uh, yes. It's not in presentation mode, but we can see this, the slides at the side, but we can see it. There we go. There we go. Let me swap that. That's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, normally it happens when I give a talk. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so we assume I amino mean, acid permeates is a negative regulator of some tolerance or a positive regulator of uh, some sense of, uh, thermal sensitivity. Okay, so BRIPS, you know, brief introduction of a cryptococcus. So it is Basidiomycet fungus, although it grows as yeast. So this fungus is closer to mushroom than yeast. Okay. So the infection normally occurs in age patients, in some cases otherwise healthy individuals. So importantly, cryptococcus cause more death than tuberculosis in sub-Saharan area. So infection can occur pulmonary in the lung and cryptococcus can migrate to the central nerve system. So we were in search of the responsible amino acid permeate. Okay? So we look at the paper published by the Joe lab. So they published a series of you know, genes negatively regulated by calcineurin. In this case, in a well, very well-known transcription factor in the uh, CIG1 independent uh, expression pattern. So we found the one amino acid permeate is there. Spiritococcus has known to have uh, eight different amino acid permeates. We check, including this expression of every single of amino acid permeates. They found this one actually is expression of this one is elevated in the presence of the calcineurin inhibitor. This fits the criteria. This could be the amino acid permeates we are in search of. We named this spike one. In a collaboration with Sun Ban and Kyung Tae Lee at Yonsei University at Seoul, uh, South Korea, the Kyung Tae is now uh, runs his own lab at Jungkook National University in South Korea now. So we checked this bike one phenotype. Okay, again, Y type in the presence of FK506 is sensitive at 37 degrees. But this is a FKDP type of mutant. This is completely resistant because there's no drug target. And catalytic and regulatory subunit mutants of calcineurin are struggling at 37, regardless of the drug. So this is Baikuan mutant. So three independently derived mutants exhibit partial resistance to FK506. And double mutant regulatory subunit and bike mutant also show partial resistance to FK506. This exactly fits our criteria. It seems like even in cryptococcus, calcineurin negatively regulated the expression of bike one. And bike one is a positive regulator of thermal sensitivity, one negative regulator of thermal tolerance. But we found very weird phenomena. So we used this thing several times. And so we went through the several rounds of a vegetative growth. Then Amazingly, this mutant lost is resistant. So it's not really different from white and now. Double mutants are really are not really different from the original single mutant. We were scratching our head, what is going on? So we also it's possible amnesia the permeate is very general in you know, proteins. And also I mentioned that there are seven 
more, you know, aminase permeates are existing mucous genome. So we assume this could be other aminase permeates may complement or compensate the loss of a bike one. So then we generate another set of a bike one mutant and immediately test if they are resistant to FK5 or 6. These two bike one mutant, the original bike one mutant we tested, they already lost the resistance, but freshly acquired mutant still are resistant to the FK5 or 6. Seems like the resistance can be very transient. Then, we, so if the knockout of a bike one is transient, why don't we overexpress that? As I mentioned, suppression of ex expression of bike one is the what calcinidin does. Okay, then by overexpressing bike one, we may, you know, suppress the calcinidin, ex you know, impact on that. So we put bike gene on the H uh, histone promoter. So three different different. Uh, independently derived mutant exhibit thermal sensitivity. Just simply we overexpress that I mean as the term is yeah now completely sensitive to the 37 degree. Okay. So it looks like overexpression of bicogen completely recapitulate the calcinated inhibition phenotype. So now we came up with the idea so as I mentioned, calcinidin has been a promising target to develop antifungal drug, but calcinidin itself is highly conserved protein between human and fungi. So FK506 works against the fungal calcinidin pretty well. Also, it works against the human calcinidin. It's blocking immune response, cause the immune response. That's why FK506 in these is used as immune suppressor in, in human. So direct attacking calcinin may be risky, but how about we just attack calcinin pathway, especially focusing on these two, these amino acid terminals. Okay? So we are proposing any drug can elevate independent of calcinin of the expression of this you know, bike gene could be a good antifungal drug target. Okay? Our proposal is pending in NIH for the both fungal systems, mucor and cryptococcus. So the, the last part is this resistant pathway actually further demonstrates that there's a genetic link between calcinidin, aminase determinism, and protein kinase A in mucor and cryptococcus both. So indeed we found calcinidin is negatively regulated to the amino acid permeans and amino acid permeans positively regulated to the, the protein kinase A activity. And this, pro, the end of that, there's a thermal sensitivity for muco and uh, invasive hypergross blockade in, uh, uh, excuse me, in the cryptocos and invasive hypergross blockade in muco. So at the very early stage, I told you CO2 induced hypergrowth, uh, yeast growth in mucor, right? So CO2 diffuses into the cell, then a carbonic anhydrase in, convert that into bicarbonate. Bicarbonate activate cytosolic isolate cyclase, which result in the production of cyclic AMP. Then cyclic AMP activation of a protein kinase A is very well known, you know, the mechanism. So, and several articles also describe elevate protein kinase activity is key for muco to grow as yeast form. Looks like elevated protein kinase A is yeast, uh, yeast driving force, but calcineurin is hypergross driving force. Okay. Indeed, in the high CO2 condition, in the white time muco cell has when they grow in high, in an anaerobic with high CO2, you see elevated protein kinase activity compared to the wild type in anaerobic condition. This is hypergrowth. And also this elevated PKA activity is correlated with the elevated level of cyclic AMP. So cyclic AMP actually binds to the regulatory subunit of PKA. Now PKA catalytic subunit is released to become active. Right? So this makes sense. 
Then we also found when you block the calcineurin function by having mutation or by adding drug, we saw elevated protein kinase A activity. So it looks like calcineurin activity and PK activities are antagonistic each other in morphology and this field. But this elevated PK activity is cyclic AMP level independent. It's a completely new way to activate protein kinase A. So indeed, Buco, this connection is really, really, you know, it's working in between invasive hypergrowth for and the, the yeast form. And in cryptococcus, is this also conserved? So peak, we test PKA mutant in cryptococcus. As you can see, this mutant is resistant to the calcineurin inhibitor PK5 or 6 in two different media. Actually, indeed, this you know, three a protein connection is really conserved in uh, cryptococcus too. So it looks like PKA is responsible for sensitivity to 37D. And calcineurin is responsible for an you know, thermal tolerance at 37D. So to overall summarize this talk, I mentioned there's a link between calcineurin and amino acid permease and protein kinase A. In these two fungal systems, calcineurin is responsible for invasive hypergrowth in muco and also growth and 37 degree in cryptococcus. But PKA is responsible for the blockade of invasive hypergrowth or imposed yeast growth in muco and thermal sensitivity in cryptococcus. And these two big signaling molecules is linked with the amino acid permeates. Okay. There, there are two major questions here. So I mentioned calcineurin controlled expression of a bicosin in transcription level. In, what is the linking transcription factor? What is the linking transcription regulator? Okay. So we are working on this. And also how this amino acid permeates activate protein kinase A in an independent way. There's a several articles uh, published in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Actually, general amino acid permeates, yeah, technically activate PKA activity in a cyclic AB in independence way. So this amino acid permeates function as permeates and at the same time as a signaling molecule for PKA activity. So this amino acid permeates is endocytosed there and triggering the signaling. So we try to figure out how in what part of the amino acid permeates is involved in the, this signaling to activate the protein kinase A. So in yeast, so several in article verified that the C-terminal domain is involved in the, in the PK activity regardless of the amino acid permeates activity. So we'll see if these kind of things in conserved in cryptocox and can, uh, cryptococcus and mycoc. So my collaborator, Steve Savile at UTSA is working, this so pathway is conserving the candida albicans or not. So we have several evidences that candida albicans may conserve this pathway. So linking uh, calcineurin and amino acid permeates and protein kinase A. So with this, this is my acknowledgement. This is my current lab member and previous lab member. So MUCO BICA study has been done by Sandy Berlankis. He's my previous uh, PhD student. He's now a postdoc at uh, Rob Kreimer's lab, Dartmouth. And Cryptocox part has been done by collaborator and also my undergraduate student, Madeline Geiner, and also myself work on this part too. So this is uh, our in-house mycologist, Jose, Steve, Chang, uh, has just recently joined to the department, and we are really happy to have to have him. And Yonsei University collaborator, Duke collaborator, so that this is my funding source. So I'm more than happy for answering any questions you have. Thank you very much, Suchan. No problem. Thank you too. Okay, so uh, we will now have questions for both speakers. Um, so Neil, I think you're gonna start with questions for David. 
I am. And just as well, we've got half an hour because we've got quite a pile of questions. David, let me kick off with a, a question um, which is from Mukun Ramakrishnan. And it is asking how you think candida gets over the blood brain barrier to cause that pathology. Sure. Uh, yeah, we've kind of buzzed through that kind of quick. Um, so the, our, what our data indicate is that it's really the SAPs, the critical sporadic proteases that are key to to, to uh, getting across the blood-brain barrier. Th those proteases really are unbelievably powerful, and they readily dissolve tight junction proteins. Um, and, and in so doing, they do compromise the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and uh, so it's possible to demonstrate that long after that infection, uh, the, the initial infection with Canada, the blood brain barrier remains compromised. So it's something that that, that is not only the, it's a compromise that's induced by the fungus, but it's something that's maintained uh, even after the fungus has been at least initially eliminated uh, from the brain. So again, it's it's just really dissolving away those those um, uh, those um, uh, the tight junction proteins uh, through the saps. There clearly are other issues going on. There must be an arrest phase. The fungus must be stopping somewhere in the blood brain barrier. Uh, presumably through adhesions, but we're, we're just getting into that work now. I don't really know much about that at this point. Okay, so uh, I guess what you're saying is that SAP mutants, and there's some triple mutants at least with SAP 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, 6, are they compromised in the ability to get there? Good that's exactly right. So, so, yeah, that's exactly right, Neil. So the SAP 2 knockout in particular is basically completely unable to get into the brain. There's a, there's a significant, but not a huge, uh, if you, for example, the SAP 1, 2, 3, uh, mutant uh, is about a, is um, only about th uh, has about a thir thirty percent uh, uh, capable of getting into the brain, but the, again the SAP two is completely unable uh, to get it. So again, we think that SAP two really is. And they all contribute, but it's probably SAP two is the main one. No, oh, great, thank you. I'll pass to Geraldine. Okay, so apologies in advance for all the names I'm going to mispronounce. But we have a question from Andre Ceballos um, it's about the definition of resistance. So knowing that FK506 is not an antifungal in that it doesn't kill the fungi, is it correct to state that you have a new mechanism of resistance? Yes, it's correct. It's completely new mechanisms of resistance. Just having retention in aminoacid permits confer the carcinogen inhibitor resistance. So this is really new. It has not been reported. Okay. I think he's questioning what, do you really call it resistance when FK? Okay, resistance means, yeah, yeah. in mucor. So yeah. making hypey in the presence of a calcineurin inhibitor is resistance. Okay. So you... Sensitivity means grow as is to lock pump in the presence of calcineurin inhibitor. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So David, here's a, a question about the mouse model. There's a couple of things about the mice themselves. So obviously Alzheimer's sort of progresses progressively common in older age. So question is Matthew Blanco was asking as whether the age of the mice in any way affect um, this interaction and uh, do you see low dose induction of figs? Do you use old mice? Do you see more or longer lived lesions, perhaps. Yeah, so that's a good question. We, we've we've only partially begun to look at that issue. We have looked. We have infected uh, for the first time um, older mice. So the ones that we had were about a year and a half. Uh, about so that's about half the age uh, of a mouse can typically live uh, in, under you know excellent conditions uh, up to three years. So we took a uh, year and a half old mice and infected them. So we found that at least within the first 10 days, they have much, much higher, like 10 times higher fungal burdens in their brains. Uh, but ultimately, uh, they still clear uh, everything by 10 days. So there's this initial, it's a little hard to understand this. It's a, initially, they, they show this defect, the older mice that is, but they rapidly catch up. And so at the end of the day, they're, they're no different from uh, from. Uh, from from uh, younger mice, so we don't quite know what that means. So we have to do obviously long, longer term studies. We're just getting uh, we're just getting data on our for on our six month experiment with younger mice, but we clearly we need to do this with older mice and really see how that shakes out. So there's some evidence that yes, there is 
uh, let's call it senescence uh, of the immune response, uh, but it's of unclear significance really in terms of, of how Alzheimer's-like disease might, uh, might present. Okay, thanks, thanks David. Okay, uh, for Suchan from Ted Weiss, nice presentation. And he says the calcium urine is known to affect azole susceptibility. So have you tested susceptibility to azoles or other drugs like terbinafine or aconicantins in your big bike one and bike A mutations? Okay, so calcium does many things in base of hyperglose per mucor and if a thermocolorance is one thing, and, but we test actually is a bike A mutant is a little bit irrelevant to the age of you know, susceptibility. Yeah. And, but uh, we didn't test with the terbinafine, but we tested with that kind of candle. We found the calcinated mutant is a little bit sensitive to sensitive to economic candy in mucor. Indeed, we found the calcinated is, is involved in the mucose intrinsic resistance of the kind of candy. So it controls the expression of economic kind of candy targeting FKS gene in mucor. So by deleting calcinating, we found that so the, the, the mucor becomes susceptible, not very susceptible, but the MIC got lower. That may be calcium positive regulator. But interestingly, BICA gene does less thing against a kind of candy resistance. <laughs> so it seems like invasive hypergrowth and a kind of candy resistance controlling by calcium is completely separate. That means very mm -hmm. likely two different transcription factors or two different transcription regulators are involved in the separate pathways. Okay, and uh, did you say there was no effect on azole sensitivity? Right, right. So it's a, a little bit irrelevant. So yeah, it's no effect. Okay, okay thanks. So David, a question from Claudio Duarte Oliveira. Um, so noticing that uh, healthy uh, individuals also get these lichenoids, which are these bacterial uh, yeast structures, Mm -hmm. So to get the disease, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, do you need to sort of prime that, that system with um, an exacerbated immune response like the TH2 response you see in asthma? And is it possible that microbial peptides are inducing that kind of exacerbated response? Uh, so uh, if I understand the question, no. Uh, so the mice that we're working with in terms of the Alzheimer's model are completely naive. They're perfectly capable of making T2 and T70 responses, but let me, let me make it clear that uh, there is no T cell, there is no adaptive immune response operating in the central nervous system. It's all innate. So we've done some careful flow cytometry of the inflammatory cells in the brain after this model. The only cells that are there uh, really are of, of immune nature are what you'd expect. So microglia, ast astrocytes as well, but there are no lymphocytes, there's no neutrophils, um, so it's strictly an innate sort of thing. So there really is no TH2, TH17 going on, at least in the central nervous system. Of course, you know, when you inject Canada intravenously, um, it's going to go everywhere uh, and it's probably going to incite an adaptive response somewhere, but it's, it's just, it's outside the brain. Okay. So does that have any effect on, on the, on the overall disease phenotype? You know, we haven't really looked at that. So one way to answer that might be to look at mice uh, unable to make adaptive immune responses. So T, you know, T cell deficient mice, we could repeat these experiments and see and try to answer that kind of question, but we have not, not, not done that yet. Very good question. F uh, food, food for thought for the future, for sure. Thank you. Okay, uh, for Su Chan from Vikas Yadav, great talk. Um, do you know if the bike mutation restores only hyphal growth or also other phenotypes like virulence that are associated with calcium urine and mucor? So like similar to that, the previous question, calcium does many things. So controlling invasive hypergrowth is one thing. What we also found is calcium is also controls the host pathway interactions especially calcinurin you know, conquers the macrophage maturation blockade in the core. So it blocks of you know, macrophage you know, maturation. But BICA is independent of that path. And also we know calcinurin is involved in the uh, host in the cytokine response. But and we also tested the BICA is also irrelevant for the host cytokine response. Mm -hmm. At this moment, what we can tell is, it's only yet still yet to be revealed in involving hyper-invasive hypergrowth. 
Okay, thanks. David, uh, Ruvini Patrina uh, is asking, saying, first of all, very interesting uh, findings. Um, interested in the structure of these uh, bizarre fungal structures. Did you ever use GMS staining to verify these? Um, and pointing out there have been old clinical reports showing giant um, yeast cells or blastocanidia and tissue sections, which were claimed to be potentially chlamydospores, which normally you only see in, in plate cultures with certain types of media. So do they have thick walls? And um, so that's the first part. And I've got a second part to that question in a second. Uh, yeah, so no, the, the the brief answer is no. So, uh, but I think it's an excellent question. So are these chlamydospores that we're actually looking at, you know, these bizarre giant yeast-like forms, uh, when you when you take apart these, uh, the, this lichenoid kind of growth? Um, so we, do, we don't really know the answer to, to, to that. Again, that's, again, I'm not a mycologist. If I were, I would probably have an answer for you, but I'm still interested in that question. So we'll, we'll continue to work with Bernie and, and uh, Julian, and we'll try to get an answer to that. But I don't, I don't quite know at this point, but I, I am interested in this question. I, I think it's a very relevant one. Yeah, and the supplementary thing I was thinking about myself was you've got this sort of mixed co-infection with bacteria and uh, uh, the colonies are mixed with bacteria and yeast together. Have you ever right. tried curing them uh, or plating out just to recover yeah. the fungal component and so on? And does that go back to the fairly smooth uh, colonies yeah, so that you normally think of candidates having? So that's an incredibly good and interesting question. Let me walk you through that. So if you, yeah, you just, you can easily disperse these colonies, right? And you can easily get, you know, single fungal and bacterial forms. And that, and yes, so if you then replate this on different media, what you find is that the bacteria readily grow, but the fungus never grows. Um, so it's in a trans, presumably transcriptionally completely different state. It cannot then, you know, then the, you know, the canner that we started out with, right? Infected the mice with. So it cannot grow on its own anymore. It, it must be part of that lichenoid in, in order to grow at least on artificial media. Um, so again, so how can we be sure this is Canada? So we very carefully went through that, you know, with, uh, you know, whole genome and, and, uh, ITS2, but also using fluorescent Canada, we can be certain that, that what were these forms that kind of look fungal, well, they really are the Canada, but it's very, very different form, uh, transcriptionally, I presume. Uh, so, uh, we're headed into that into understanding what are some of those transcriptional, uh, differences between the different forms of Canada that might explain that. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Suchan, can I ask you about the the amino acid permease family? So they're, they're a really large family. So yeah. how, how similar are the two from the two species? And do you, do you know their orthologs or, or why did you? Yeah, so, yeah, so based on this connection, they looks like, a, you know, ortholog. So I would say it's a functional ortholog. Okay. But Although they are predicted to be amino acid permeates, actually bona fide amino acid permeates, but the sequence is completely diverse. By using cryptococcus amino acid permeates to be blessed, mucobica doesn't come up. Okay. So vice versa. So mucobica is really diverse, even from other fungal systems. Of course, they're highly diverse from human. So it looks like of course, calcinurin and PK is really conserved the protein, but linking amino acid primers is somehow really rewired between fungal systems. Yeah. And do you think they're responding to the same amino acids, even though they look very different? So I have no idea, to be honest, but so it looks like, you know, amino acid permeates, it's just function, it, function is irrelevant with this link. So just this signaling property. That's why, so, and maybe different type of amino acid permeates has been evolved in, in this kind of you know, convergent functions. Okay, thanks. Um, here, here's an interesting question from, from Peter Cook, David. Um, fantastic talk, first of all, mustn't, mustn't forget that. Uh, very stimulated by the idea of fungal granulomas in our brains. And, and many of us remember that fascinating uh, paper showing that when you have um, infections of Toxoplasma gondii, which form cysts in the brains, that you get changes in behavior. I think this was done in an interesting man animal model. So, could a similar situation be possible here with the fungal uh, granulomas, perhaps the number and size of those, be associated with, associated with certain 
human behaviors, did you see, or did you see any changes in the behaviors of the mice associated with those infections? Yeah. So Peter, that's a great question. And so I didn't have, I, in practicing this talk, I realized I didn't have time to show it because it's complicated data and it doesn't transmit well uh, in a 30 minute uh, format when I'm trying to squeeze in all kinds of other things. But let me just walk you through. Uh, we have a huge infrastructure now in the laboratory. I'm no neuroscientist, but I'm turning into one, I guess. We got a huge infrastructure for studying mouse behavior. Lynn Bimler is the postdoc working on this project has really mastered uh, the art of, of, of doing mouse neurocognitive testing. It's extraordinary what she's coming up with. We're just completing a six month experiment looking at you know, a whole giant battery of tests and uh, um, looking at behaviors. So what, what I can tell you, I didn't have time to work that into talk is that yes, a mouse behavior over six months gradually changes. So the mice become, first of all, they become extremely anxious. So they do start doing very bizarre things. You can't even do tests with them anymore because you put them into the chamber, whatever that chamber is, do the test, and they just jump right out. You're just like panicking. Uh, so, you know, and, and it's, 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 you know, worth noting this because anxiety is a characteristic feature of Alzheimer's disease and other chronic neurodegenerative disorders. But, but more, even more importantly is the mice progressively lose memory so that even at, um, four months, we now have significant data that the cohort that's infected, one of the cohort, or the two cohorts, cohorts that we have that are infected with Canada uh, is uh, showing signs of long-term memory loss. So both behaviorally and memory, we're showing progressive month by month uh, accumulating defects um, uh, that is consistent with Alzheimer's disease. So that, I think that partially answers your question, hopefully, but but I think that maybe what the, the other issue that, that maybe what you're getting at is you know, humans show a whole bunch of bizarre behaviors uh, over time. They can develop, you know, schizophrenia, depression, uh, all uh, obsessive compulsive disorders. Um, we see evidence of obsessive compulsive disorder also in our mice. And so, yeah, so we're wondering, uh, is there uh, a relation to Canada in the brain, maybe perhaps falling short of Alzheimer's disease and, and multiple sclerosis and other chronic degenerative disorders that fungi have been linked to? But some of these other very quite devastating um, neuropsychiatric disorders like like chronic depression, chronic schizophrenia, could those also be related to fungus? I think those are incredibly intriguing in questions. They're very much open at this point and very well worth uh, pursuing. I will point out that there is a very strong link between Canada and schizophrenia that's already known, but that there, a lot more work really needs to be uh, developed in that area. Very, very fascinating. Yeah. yeah, you're making me even more worried about having candles out all over the place. <laughs> um, Suchan, there's something you said at the beginning of your talk that I hadn't realized. You said there are a lot of species that are associated with, with mucormycosis. So the, 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 the infections we've been hearing about recently, the ones you referred to in India, are they all mucor or are they different species? So there are several different species. So Rhizopus, but Rhizopus is pretty non dominant species there. And Muco species, and also Alphophysomyces species. Yeah. Okay, so, so it's, it's very it's general, funny. right? It's very general. Funny. Yeah, Rhizopus is kind of like count like more than 50% of the yeah. mucomycosis. Okay, thanks. So David, I'm going to put in one of my own questions, if I may. Um, you showed that the um, A beta peptides, which are generated from the uh, amyloid precursor protein, accumulate on the surface of candida. Now, right. candida also, on its own surface, has a number of proteins which are amyloid forming. They include um, ALS5, ALS1, one plo one These are all cell proteins with a capacity to form amyloids. And mm -hmm. amyloid Gen regeneration is a kind of autocatalytic thing, isn't it? It doesn't require extent. One triggers another protein to form the amyloid plaque. And I'm just wondering whether there's this possible interaction of different amyloid species at the surface, which triggers that, that formation. And, and, you know, obviously there's some fairly straightforward uh, experiments using mutants. These are the proteins generated by Peter Lipke uh, that could be used to, to test that idea. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, that's a great point. You know, it's, 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 it is, um, I think it is a great question. So again, uh, for people that may not be quite aware of this, so, you know, amyloid peptides, you know, coming together, that's one thing, but then, uh, you know, the, the key thing about the CNL plaque and Alzheimer's is that they don't just, they're not just random, right? So they're, they're in, they're in a structured pseudocrystalline 
sort of array that uh, bends light a certain way, right? And, and, uh, and hence has this am that's the kind of the definition of amyloid. But yeah, so what causes that, right? There's gotta be some mechanism that leads to that. And so could that be actually related to the fungus? I think it's a great question. We have certainly have not looked at that. Part of the problem is the mouse version of the amyloid uh, beta peptides are, don't, do not have that amyloidogenic potential. So they, don't, they actually don't form the crystalline deal that you see in the human form. Uh, so we can't really study this in mouse. Uh, so, uh, but th there are mice that express uh, that, that in which the, the, you know, the, the APP has been replaced with, with uh, human APP. And so it, it, with that mouse, actually, we could potentially address that using Canada, you know, with the various knockouts, right, uh, that were potentially linked to amyloidogenesis. So yeah, so with these transgenic mice combined with transgenic fungi, it could be possible to study that. That's a great point. Thank you. I think we've addressed all the questions for Suchan. So Neil, if you want, there, there are still a couple remaining for David. There is. Um, so one is uh, from Jesus Romo, uh, David. Are your mice antibiotic treated in the gut dissemination model? Uh, the, for the data that I showed you, yeah, so again, or the mice treated with antibiotics. And for the data that I showed you, no. Uh, but we have done that experiment to see kind of what begins to address that, that issue of, you know, alterations in the, in the microbiome and, and might this affect the brain phenotype. So if, if you give mice antibiotics uh, to deplete the bacterial microbiome, of course, um, what you get is this massive bloom, as you almost certainly know, right? So you get this massive bloom of Canada in the gut. Uh, so you'd think that there'd be a massive bloom in the brain and a much worse disease, but it's exactly the opposite. So you get fewer fungus in the brain when you have this massive antibiotic dependent bloom of Canada in the gut. That was a real surprise. We have absolutely no idea what that mechanism is, but somehow there is, uh, this is part of the evidence that there exists a gut brain axis that, that it heavily influences, you know, the, the, at least the, the, the volume of fungus, if you will, that ultimately gets into the brain. Um, and, and so we don't really have a good handle on that at all, We're, but we are very interested in that. We want to move forward with that. So yeah, it, it, thanks for bringing that up. It's a really cool phenomenon, but it needs a huge amount of work to really to get developed. Okay, and this is a nice question from Rebecca Hall, who's obviously thinking about why is it you can't sort of recover the candida from these lichenoid structures? And yeah. She's proposing that maybe the candida has got, in, in these structures, got a defect in the wall, and that causes the enlargement, but maybe the polymicrobial nature of that prefers protection, and when you remove that, then you, you lose the viability. So the question, therefore, is have you tried recovering candida in osmostable media, e.g. sorbitol-containing media, to see if you can recover the candida cells away uh, from great, bacteria? Yeah, great suggestion. I've not tried that. That's an excellent thought. Um, I guess I, I, my thinking was that um, at the point that you have when these lichenoids grown in a plate, that it's just, uh, uh, the, metabolically, it's dependent on something that's coming from the bacteria. I mean, why would you have, that's the same situation that exists, you know, in a, in a, in a true lichen, right? So the, the, the different organisms, uh, you know, derive uh, nutrients and met metabolic substrates from each other. I presume the same thing is kind of going on. Uh, and that, but then you separate the different organisms. They may not be able to grow up because they're missing the key. Now they're missing a key metabolite they're dependent on. That's what I was thinking. Uh, but but that's an equally interesting hypothesis. And that at least we can test that one pretty easily. Yeah. It'd be harder to test the metabolic thing. Uh, so anyway, thank you for the, for the suggestion. That's cool. So those... Those are the questions which we've been, quite a range of which have been fired to you. Thanks very much for answering them and obviously to Shu Chan as well. So I'll pass back to Geraldine to close off the session. Yeah, so it's been right on time. Thanks very much. So thanks to Su Chan Lee and to David Curry. They were great, both great talks. And hopefully we'll see you all back again in October. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks both. Yeah. Okay, great. Later. great day. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye.